Well, good morning. What an awesome opportunity to come before the Lord and worship Him this morning. Um, just to give you an update, last weekend I was not here. Um, I, I was able to celebrate Mother's Day with my wife, which was awesome. Our family was able to go to church together, and it was amazing. And then on Monday, my wife Jenny and I celebrated 24 years of marriage. And so uh, that is an evidence of God's grace right there. God is so gracious that he blessed me with a wife uh, that is able to put up with me and able to extend grace to me repeatedly. And I'm just so thankful uh, for Jenny and for all that God has done in our marriage and in our life together. In fact, um, this morning, as I was driving up here, I was thinking, you know what? Is there a story I could share? And you know what? A lot of times in life, life does not go as planned. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this idea, this concept, this theology of understanding that life does not go as planned. Well, on vacation uh, a number of years ago, Jenny and I uh, packed a picnic lunch, and we were in Florida, so I'm like, let's drive to the beach and have lunch at the beach, which sounds awesome. And then I was thinking, you know what? As we were driving by the beach, I noticed that uh, there was a, a special beach, and it was a beach called Dog Beach. And I had this idyllic idea, uh, you know, we love dogs. So I'm like, I had this idea that we would be overlooking the ocean, dogs would be running around, we would be enjoying our lunch, and it just, in my mind, it looked so, so peaceful, so happy, so full of joy, so amazing that we were going to have this idyllic setting to have a picnic lunch at. So we pulled out our lunch, we went down by the beach, down by Dog Beach, we set out a blanket, we laid out our lunch, and as soon as we laid out our lunch, we were attacked by dogs. <laughs> um, I was bowled over by an 80-pound dog who proceeded to eat my lunch. <laughs> and this did not bring me great happiness. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. So this idyllic picture in my mind was completely obliterated uh, by getting taken out by a dog. And then we had to fight for what was remaining of our lunch uh, with, with these dogs, and we decided never to go to Dog Beach again, at least not with our lunch. And the reality is, as we go through life, we're going to encounter things that rob us of happiness and cause us to become very frustrated. But the reality of joy is something much more profound than that. We can have a deep-rooted joy that is not based on our circumstances of life, but is based on the one who holds our life together. And each and every one of us desperately need to have a joy that is unstoppable. My hope and prayer is as we go through this coming series through the book of Philippians, is that we understand where joy comes from, where joy is found. Now, to give us a little background, um, Paul, one of my favorite characters of the entire Bible, um, we, we could go through the whole book of Acts and kind of follow the story of his life from his conversion on the road to Damascus, found in Acts chapter 9, all the way through his, to his death in Acts chapter 28. We could, we could do that this morning but we'd be here for hours. And I don't think we want to be here for hours, although we'd really enjoy the time together, I'm sure. Um, but just to give a brief snapshot, Paul was originally Saul, and he was persecuting the early church. But two years after Christ's ascension back into heaven, after his resurrection, Paul had an encounter with Jesus. And it was not what Paul expected. What Paul expected is that he was going to go to the city of Damascus and continue his persecution of the early church.
But God had a completely other, other plan for him. So what God did on that road to Damascus completely transformed Paul. Paul did not expect that, but in the end, Paul found great joy in his encounter with Jesus. And as we encounter Jesus together this morning, my hope and prayer is that we encounter the joy that only he can bring and that he would breathe life into us and that we would take on a whole new mindset, a whole new way of living. Now, if there is one key verse... Oh, the clicker is not working. Um, there is one key verse that I'd, I hope was going to pop up on the screen, but it doesn't seem to be popping up. There we go. If there is only one key verse from the whole book of Philippians, this is it. Chapter 2, verse 5. It says... Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So that sounds pretty straightforward. Have this mind, have this mind, um, <laughs> have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now you, you look at that and you go, okay, that it, we need some explaining. If that's the key verse, that's a lousy key verse um, because we don't understand what it's saying. So it's saying, have, the, have this mind among yourselves. And he's saying a mind that's transformed by Jesus. Paul is saying that when our mind is thinking in a different way, our lives are going to follow what we believe. Our lives are going to follow what our mind is telling us. Now, Paul goes on to say, and if we look at the next verses, it says, who though he, uh, who though he was in who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Think about this. Jesus left heaven and came down to this sin-soaked world and was born as an infant. Now, I have a great niece that was just born this past week. When babies are born, they are completely helpless. Jesus came completely helpless as an infant, and he knew he came for the purpose of dying to set us free from our sins so that we might have life. And then he was resurrected. He was risen again by God. So if we look at this, the reality of him coming and being born and being, becoming a human is unbelievable. It is the first part of the gospel story um, that he was born and he lived a perfect life. Jesus lived a perfect life. And not only did he live a perfect life, uh, he died a brutal death. It says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Christ was willing to die so that we might live. He not only was born and became a human, but he was born to die. He lived a perfect life, died a brutal death, so that we might have life everlasting. It goes on to say that, oh, sorry. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul had a habit throughout his, throughout his entire life of getting in trouble much like myself in junior high. Um, you know, he was always getting in trouble. In junior high, I had my own seat in the office, um, if that tells you anything about me. Um, but Paul, continually, as he went through his life, he went from persecuting the church to this radically transformed um, happening on the road to Damascus, where all of a sudden he is not living to persecute the church. He's living to expand the church. 
And that is a radical transformation in Paul's life. That Paul said, you know what? I have been changed by what Jesus has done for me. Jesus came and gave me life where he was persecuting the church. Now he wanted to see the church flourish. We're aware of 14 churches that Paul helped start. And he also wrote 13 books of our New Testament. So he was always either doing, he was out there planting churches, or when he was imprisoned, he was writing letters. And one of the letters that he wrote was to the church in Philippi. And that's where we get this book of Philippians. The city of Philippi uh, was one of the, it was, it's an ancient city. It goes back to um, finding its beginnings almost 400 years before Christ. And Philippi was famous for one particular event. In 42 B.C., Mark Anthony and Octavius defeated Brutus and Caesar and Cassius um, and assassinated Julius Caesar in the Battle of Philippi. Later in 31 B.C., when Octavius defeated Anthony and Cleopatra at Artemis, uh, he assumed the name Augustus and rebuilt the city of Philippi. And this became a place for retired soldiers to enter or to, to retire in. So Philippi, uh, the reality of Philippi was that it was full of retired military folks that wanted to pay um, complete homage and complete authority to, to the Roman authorities. And Paul is preaching this message that, you know what, Jesus is Lord. And that flew right in the face of what the people, the citizens of Philippi believed. They believed that their political leaders, their rulers, were Lord. And so Paul is preaching this message, and he's continually getting in trouble for preaching the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Paul goes on to say that for him to live is awesome because he is able to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, but for, to, for him to die would be gain. Next week, or in the coming weeks, we'll be talking about Paul's, Paul has a win-win attitude on life. They're like, oh, Paul's like, if you're going to kill me, that's awesome. I get to go be with Jesus. If you're going to let me live, that's awesome because I get to proclaim who Jesus is. And so his author, the, the, the authorities that wanted to imprison Paul couldn't stop him. They said, you know what, we want to make him suffer. And he's like, you can't make me suffer. If you kill me, that's awesome. If I live, I get to live for Christ. And Paul wanted the church in Philippi to be filled with joy. He wanted them to have a joy that was unstoppable. But he also knew that since the church is full of people, there are, there are things that happen within the body of Christ that could cause dissension or, or a demise, a relational breakup, a problem within the church. So Paul is saying, you know what? I understand that the church is full of people and people are sinful. And that could cause division in the church in Philippi. He said, I want you to have the mind of Christ so that as you interact with one another and as you interact with the citizens of Philippi, that you are living not from a perspective of, of happiness or sadness, which is life lived, life lived that way is like a roller coaster. If we base our life on our circumstances, life is a roller coaster. There's no doubt that you will have good days and bad days. Sometimes, you know, you're sitting at home enjoying a beautiful, peaceful day. The phone rings, and you find out that a dear friend has cancer. It's not anything you expect. It's not the phone call you're hoping to get. Then other times, you receive a phone call, or you, you're viewing uh, Facebook, and you notice that there's a birth of a brand new baby. And there's great joy in that. Life is lived on these highs and lows. 
And Paul is saying, you know what? I understand that that's the reality of all our lives. That lives are lived on the highs and lows. But the reality is Paul wants the church to find deep-rooted joy that can only be found in one place. And as Ray was saying before, we're here because of Jesus. That is why we gather here as a church, because of Jesus. And the only way that we can find everlasting joy, joy unstoppable, is by finding Jesus. It sounds simple, like Jesus is the answer, but he is. And Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, I want you to have this same mind among you, that um, it's a mind transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just a gospel to save us from our sins at at the point of salvation, but it is a gospel that we grow up into as we become more and more and more like Jesus. And the only way you can become more and more like someone is by spending a lot of time with them. If you notice, sometimes um, married couples, you start looking more and more and more alike, except for, you know, Jenny's not losing her hair. Um, But over time, married couples start resembling each other. They start taking on mannerisms. They start taking on the same language. They start taking on those attributes that someone would say, wow, you are very similar to one another now. As we spend time in the presence of Jesus, as we spend time studying his word, as we spend time communing with Jesus in prayer, he will transform our hearts. And instead of living a roller coaster kind of life, we will live a life of great joy, a joy that is unstoppable. And this joy that's unstoppable, like I said, is found in one place, in one place alone, that's Jesus. So as we go through the book of Philippians, Paul, in his wisdom, has this passage that we briefly looked at today, and I want to encourage you to look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Because these are key verses. It's actually a poem called the Christ Hymn. And it's right almost in the middle of the book of Philippians. And Paul is saying everything centers around this poem. Now he's going to to introduce to us some problems that the church in Philippi is dealing with. Some of those problems are relational in nature. Some of those problems are focus problems in nature. They're focused on themselves instead of fixing their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. And other problems um, that they face are, are specifically addressed as we go through the book. And we'll unpack what those problems are. After Paul unpacks the problems, he says, you know what? This life lived out in, in this Jesus life lived out in the everyday life, if you want to see an example of that, you can follow me as I follow Christ, or you could follow Timothy as Timothy follows Christ, or you could follow Epaphroditus as he follows Christ. Now, Timothy and Epaphroditus would have been very familiar people to the church in Philippi. They would have been people that the church in Philippi knew well. Epaphroditus was from Philippi, And he is the main reason that this letter exists. Paul, next week, we're going to look at how thankful Paul is for the church in Philippi because the church in Philippi met some of his financial need while he was sitting in prison. And Paul says, this brings me so much joy to write this letter to you because of your mutual encouragement of me meeting my need while I'm in prison I want to write this letter to you to encourage you to live this Jesus life, to live a life transformed day by day by day by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we as the church, 2018, living here in Algoma, or maybe you live in Sturgeon Bay or Kiwani or one of the other surrounding towns, um, 
this same message in the book of Philippians is for us too. I know many of us, myself included, we live life based on our circumstances. And we think joy is tied to our circumstances. If our bank account is full and if we have a job that's secure and if our marriage is going perfectly and if our kids are obeying, then <laughs> why, do you, why are you guys laughing? <laughs> Doesn't this happen? Um, if we're tying our joy to our circumstances, it's a joy that will fail. It's a joy that will fall away. It's a joy that will fall apart. But if we anchor our joy to the only one who can bring us true, lasting joy, it's going to cause us to live in a brand new way. Um, there's a comedian. His name is Ken Davis. And he is totally, totally hilarious. And he, he said, you know, he goes, sometimes I walk into a church and there's people that are just like sad and they're frowning and they're miserable. And he said, I don't even want to be around those type of people because that's not the joy that Jesus brings. As Christians, we should be the most joy-filled people on earth. We should be full of everlasting joy, not because of what we have done, but because of Jesus and his work in us and through us. And when we fix our eyes on the problem, we are going to continually live in light of that problem. Whatever the problem or struggle is or sin or temptation is, we are going to be overwhelmed by that. That's why we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And as we do that, Jesus, all of a sudden, everything else fades away. And this Jesus life moves to the forefront of our existence. And as we live a life transformed by the gospel continually, that causes us to be filled with joy because we're constantly seeing God at work. We're constantly seeing evidence of his grace in our lives. We're not looking for our failures or the failures of others. We're looking for the success stories of how we see God continuing his redeeming work in us and through us. So we might ask the question, so what? Who cares? If we look at this, if we look at this book of Philippians and we say, you know what? I could live life without joy. I don't need joy. I'm doing just fine on my own. Um, we, could, we could just chalk it up and say, you know what? We don't even need to look at the book of Philippians. It, if, it's, if it's about joy and if it's about finding joy in Jesus and I'm already happy with everything I have, um, why do we need to go through this? There is coming a day where you may not have everything you have. And if your joy is tied to what you have or tied to a, a, a position you have or a, a relationship you have, it will fail you at some point. Maybe it hasn't yet, so maybe it's worked out. A number of years ago, my friend Don Biggie and I were on a trip to Ecuador. And when we arrived in the country of Ecuador, Don said, Tim, he goes, plans have changed. I said, I understand that. This happens all the time. And he said, well, we're splitting up our group that's on this mission to plant churches, and you're going to one city and I'm going to another okay, that's fine, you know, that's fine. I'll take half the group, you take half the group. We'll split and go to two different cities and this will all be fine. He said, okay. So I'm go Don said, I'm going to Bahia, which means bay. So he was going to a seaside resort <laughs> where they sip margaritas and eat shrimp cocktail all day long. And he was going to go on the beach and evangelize people on the beach to see if they would come to know Christ and if they could start a church in that city. And he said, Tim, I did not get to pick which one I was going to. That's just where I'm supposed to go. And I said, well, tell me about my city. And he said, well, you're going to Chone. And I said, where's Chone? He said, it's in the middle of the country. And Chone is known uh, for two things. They're, they're the city where all the prisoners of Ecuador are released. 
Um, that's the city where they're, all, they're released. And it's also known uh, for, be, for having the most beautiful women. That's what he said. And, and I said, oh, wow, this is going to be quite the adventure. And as we went into the cities, um, in Bahia, people, you know, our, our North Americans would walk onto the beach and say, you know what, would you like to uh, learn more about Jesus? And all that he can bring you. He can bring you health and happiness and fullness and, and he can transform your life. And these people are like, we don't want our lives transformed. We're laying on a beach sipping margaritas and eating shrimp cocktail. This is heaven. We already have our heaven. Um, in Chone, it was a completely different story. We saw many, many people come to know Christ and a church was started as a result of a handful of us going into that city uh, for a week and the prayers of God, um, of, of the church in Chone uh, to plant a daughter church uh, went out and a daughter church was planted and great joy was happening in that city but it was because people saw their desperate need for a savior. They saw that they, they had no hope apart from clinging on to Jesus and his authority in their life. So as we go through the book of Philippians, we're going to learn a few important things. Our lives are transformed by the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The powerful truths of the gospel impact every area of life every day. So our lives are impacted, not, not just our church life, but our everyday life is impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And joy comes from living an everyday gospel life. When the gospel is continually transforming us, when Jesus is invited into the innermost parts of our life, where we say, Jesus, you know what? I open myself to you. Continue your work in me and through me. Transform me from the person I am right now. Make me more like you and fill me with great joy. He will answer that prayer and he will do it. We can't fill our life with joy. When we do, we actually get the opposite. When we try to control the circumstances of our life to produce joy, we're actually producing misery. So my encouragement to each and every one of us is that we would pray at the beginning of this series called Unstoppable Joy, I, that we would pray and say, God, I'm going to open myself to you, transform my heart, and fill me with your joy. That's a dangerous prayer, prayer because when we say transform our hearts, He's going to unearth junk that needs to go. And as he unearths the junk, the sin, the struggles, the temptations in our life, don't feel bad about that. When the Holy Spirit reveals our sin to us, that's a gift from God for our good. And what he wants to do is replace that with his joy. He wants to take out, he wants to empty us of ourselves and fill us with more of him. Just like Jesus emptied himself and took on the very nature of a man, the very skin of a man, so that we might have life. So I'm going to pray right now and pray to the end that what Jesus does in and through this study of the book of Philippians would radically transform how we live our everyday life. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, right now, I pray that you would transform our hearts and our minds. Lord, give us your mind. Give us your heart. Lord, any wayward actions or any wayward thoughts that are within us, Lord, we, we invite you to reveal them to us. And Lord, as you do, Lord, we pray that you would replace that with your joy, a joy that's unstoppable. 
Lord, let us not cling to things of this world. Let us cling only to you. Lord, we pray all this in your mighty and holy name. Amen.